What is a jet fighter? Well, a lifting body, a trapezoid wing with missiles on suspension, all turning stabilizers, air intakes, a tricycle landing gear, a jet engine. One or better two. Classic. Sometimes it's even difficult to imagine the times when solutions that are completely obvious to us did not yet exist and the question of what a jet fighter is was not at all idle. And because of this, it becomes especially interesting to watch how the fathers and grandfathers of modern jet aviation tried to understand what is this jumble of compressors, turbines and nozzles and what to do with all of it. Today we are in luck, as not only a virtual acquaintance through video and photos awaits us, but also a completely personal one. We are at the Vadim Zadorozhny Vehicle Museum, which is packed to the eyeballs with all kinds of wild awesomeness. And among all this beauty is our today's hero, the first Soviet jet fighter adopted for service and the symbol of the first steps towards a jet future. I present to you the Yakovlev Yak-15. The era of the birth of jet aviation is without a doubt the Second World War. Different countries entered this era in different ways. The most active at it were the two fiery neighbors, Germany and the United Kingdom being industrial giants since the early 1940s clashed in a merciless aerial war with various success and both directed huge resources to the development of their military aircraft. The United States also paid a lot of attention to its jet aviation, understanding its prospects and directing decent resources, which fortunately they had. The USSR in this matter found itself in a difficult situation. On the one hand, Soviet aviators also understood very well that those roaring barrels are not gonna be just theory and devices on the stands for long. But given the monstrous scale of the war, the country had no time for high science and the military industry was focused on creating more practical vehicles that could effectively fight in a rather limited resource base. The theme of jet aviation was developing, but by the leftover principle, it was far from actual production. This concept was correct. The achievements of the German engineers were very impressive, but the combat vehicles they created were late and by and large did not make much of a difference, which is good. However, by the end of the war, there was nowhere to postpone the jet era. The Americans, albeit limitedly, drove the Bell P-59 Aero Comet, which was already supposed to be replaced by the serial Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star. And the British quite successfully mastered the most widespread at that time, the Havilland Vampire and Gloucester Meteor. The Soviet aviators were falling behind and could not afford delays. The jet era had come and it was already dangerous to lag behind in it. Most of the problems were precisely with the engines, the most complex and technologically advanced part of any aircraft, especially a jet. Here, the achievements of an already defeated enemy helped. After the war, a huge amount of German materials, technologies, equipment and the engines themselves ended up in the hands of Soviet engineers. And since there was no time for long-term research, it was decided to establish their own production of copies as soon as possible. The most interesting were the UMO 004 and BMW 003. They were quite advanced. With a mass of 6 to 700 kilograms, they developed thrust of nearly 8.8 .8 kilonewtons. By modern standards, of course, this is kindergarten, but for that time, it was pretty cool. It was those engines that were installed on German jet aircraft, and they became a godsend for engine builders around the world. The local version of UMO 004 received the RD-10 index and the brainchild of BMW, respectively the RD-20. It was extremely difficult to master them. Even with the technology available, they demanded very serious attention to themselves in the materials and in the quality of assembly, so it took a long time and effort to establish production and increase volumes. The designers of the aircraft also found themselves in a difficult position. The schemes of jet airframes and the location of various elements are obvious to us now. At that time, aviators were well versed in piston planes, but jet aircraft were terra incognita, with a knowledge base that was mostly theoretical. What these aircraft were supposed to look like remained unclear. The temptation, of course, was the use of foreign experience, like the German one, for example. Twin-engine aircraft, such as the Messerschmitt 262, seemed quite attractive, with more thrust and higher reliability. Such schemes were preferred by most of the Soviet aviators, except for one. 
The design bureau under the leadership of Alexander Yakovlev was always known for its fighters – light, maneuverable and easy to control. They didn't like the idea of creating a twin-engine aircraft. It would definitely turn out to be heavier and more complicated, would take more time to create, and Yakovlev was well aware of the potential lack of engines. Therefore, the aviators decided to make a single-engine aircraft. Moreover, they went the fastest way and turned to solutions with which there was more than enough experience. As the base of the future aircraft was taken the Yak-3, quite a new and advanced aircraft with decent performance and at the same time already mass-produced. There were fewer risks, most of the elements and systems of the aircraft had already been worked out and did not hold any surprises. The problem was that the Yak-3 had a piston engine, the replacement of which with a jet engine could hardly be called a simple remotorization. For the new power plant, the nose section had to be significantly altered. The engine was once again placed in front of the cockpit, but lower and at a slight angle, so the air intake was at the leading edge, and the jet stream from the nozzle went under the fuselage. The fuselage itself in the lower part, which came in contact with the jet stream, was slightly cut, and a steel plate was installed which was supposed to hold the heat. The so-called Redden design made it possible to avoid complex modifications. Most of the airframe and onboard instruments were transferred from the Yak-3 directly, even the fabric covering was preserved in some places. In April 1945, a month before the end of the war in Europe, the Yakovlev Design Bureau was entrusted with the task of creating the aircraft they proposed. The deadlines were in the format Complete by Yesterday. Since mastering the planned RD-10 engines was difficult, it was decided to equip the first machines with the German Yumo 004, with subsequent replacement when the Soviet version was ready. In the early stages, the plane was called Yak-3 Yumo. Work on the project was carried out at a frantic pace, and the simplification of solutions with the existing base aircraft did its job. The prototype was assembled in the fall of 1945, just a few months after receiving the official directive for creation. However, there was a price for such speed. During the first test of the engine as part of the finished aircraft, the jet stream passing under the steel shield burned through the tail aluminum casing and melted the wheel. The plane had to be modified, the shield was made longer and the wheel could not be removed. So the rubber was replaced with steel. It vibrated at the airfield, sparked, made noise and heated up, but remained fully functional. Along with solving the first problems, the number of prototypes also increased. Unlike the unarmed first plane, the second arrived already equipped with a pair of 23mm NS-23 guns. The installation was done right. The guns were positioned so that when firing, the powder gases did not enter the engine. In some other aircraft, these cases caused it to stall. However, the fuel supply was cut a little. In the nose above the engine, there was an additional tank, which had to be removed to install the ammunition. The main aerodynamic compromise was the rather thick wing. For the piston Yak-3, it was ideal and showed itself perfectly at speeds of about 600-650 km per hour or 350 knots. But after all, one of the main advantages of a jet plane is its speed, and with this wing it wasn't possible to accelerate that much. The new machine added to the speed about 100 km per hour. Quite modest. The competitors, even the retired German ones, were faster. In the spring of 1946, the test program reached its peak. Already then, the Yumo 004 engines were replaced by the domestic RD-10s, so the Yak-3 Yumo was renamed Yak-RD, Yak-15 RD-10, or finally Yak-15. Now it was officially considered a new aircraft. At the same time, its main counterpart, the E-300 fighter, began testing. The future MiG-9 was in many ways similar to the Yak-15 and also used a redden scheme, but instead of one RD-10, it had a pair of RD-20 engines. Both planes took off on the same day, April 24, 1946, first the MiG-9 and a few hours later the Yak-15. There are many stories of various degrees of reliability about why they flew in this sequence, but to be honest it is not so important. As a last resort, we can say that the Yak was adopted first, so it's a draw. 
The Yak-15 showed itself very well in flights. Yakovlev's ability to make easily controlled and maneuverable machines with the replacement of the engine did not go anywhere. The nature of the new machine was very close to the Piston Progenitor, which simplified the pilot training, although there were still drawbacks. The aircraft, weighing about 2.5 tons, could be accelerated to 800 km per hour, although they tried not to abuse this, limiting themselves to 700-750 km per hour, 400 knots. The ceiling in practice reached 10,000 meters, 32,000 feet, which was less than the military's bar. They wanted 14,000. The aircraft's fuel reserve was modest. It was enough for a piston engine, but the jet engine consumed it very quickly, limiting the range to about 500 kilometers, 270 miles, or even less. And, well, the engines themselves, of course, had a bunch of minor problems. A resource of about 20 hours and a maximum thrust, which was better not to hold for more than 10 minutes. Oh, those first jet engines. The competition between the Yak and the MiG spurred both designers and testers very much, but it also had side effects. Sometimes they'd get carried away. During comparative flights, one of the MiGs trying to perform a difficult maneuver crashed. However, work continued on both projects. For the first time, this pair was presented publicly at the Air Parade in Tushana in August 1946. The appearance in the sky of only two, but already jet aircraft, was a demonstration of the high rate of development of the aviation industry. After this demonstration, another one was supposed to be held, with 30 planes over Red Square, but it didn't work out. 30 aircraft, 15 of each model, were ready, but no luck with the weather. The airborne part of the parade had to be cancelled. Serial production of the Yak-15 was established at the aircraft plant in Tbilisi, Soviet Georgia. The Yak-3 was already being assembled there, so that was logical. The first result of mass production of jet aircraft in the USSR was the air parade in 1947, when 100 planes flew over Red Square, 50 MiGs and 50 Yaks. The premier parade showed that the USSR has jet planes. The same one showed that the jet planes are already more or less numerous. When the Yak-15 in 1946-47 began to be supplied to the military and tested by them, operational difficulties also began to manifest themselves regarding the reddened scheme with the deflected engine thrust vector. As it turned out, the jet stream that burned the plane did the same to airfields, damaging surfaces and blowing dust and stone into the air, constantly threatening to hit the tail. And in winter, the stream was melting snow, after which it immediately froze and turned the airfield into an ice rink. At first glance, a trifle, but with mass operation, ground surfaces would go crazy running around it all the time. Nevertheless, the Yak-15 behaved obediently in flight and was quite easy to pilot. This combination of advantages and disadvantages led the aircraft to its main role – training. The Air Force concluded that the limited altitude, speed and range did not allow it to be considered a full-fledged fighter. However, it being easy to master makes it an excellent training aircraft for the transition of pilots and personnel from piston to jet machines. In 1947, the production of the Yak-15 was closed. No time at all. Given that it was established in 1946, it is difficult to call it serial. On the one hand, 280 units were made, which is nevertheless a lot. On the other hand, for that time, 280 was not an impressive number. The Yak-3, for example, was made in the amount of almost 4,900. But the already assembled vehicles continued to serve. They began to be used for demonstration of aerobatics. It would be a shame not to use the capabilities of the new aircraft. An aerobatic team was even organized. Five planes, five pilots, headed by Yevgeny Savitsky, a flying ace, twice a hero of the Soviet Union, an acting general who later became a marshal. Not bad for an aerobatic pilot. But it wasn't aerobatics and training alone. The Yak-15 was quite actively used to practice various jet aviation tactics and methods of working with it in certain situations. In particular, working out the technique of refueling in the air began with these planes. Naturally, despite the closure of production of the Yak-15, the program of creating fighters at Yakovlev itself was not cancelled at all. 
Already in the summer of 1947, a seriously updated aircraft took to the skies, receiving a full-fledged tricycle landing gear, a thinner wing and improved equipment. This is how the Yak-17 was born, as well as its long-awaited two-seater brother, the Yak-17 Uti training fighter. These aircraft were already much more practical than their ancestors and there were more of them produced, 430 units. The third big modification and the final milestone in the campaign of Redden Designs was the Yak-23, which very conveniently stands next to our main hero. Unlike the Yak-15 and Yak-17 made on the basis of the third, the 23rd was created from scratch. The aircraft received a new, more aerodynamic airframe, a developed wing with flaps, there weren't any before, and most importantly a completely new RD500 engine with a thrust of 15.6 kN, twice as powerful as the RD10. It's funny, while the old guy was the localization of the German, the newcomer became the localization of the British. The RD500 was made on the basis of the Rolls-Royce Derwent 5. The aircraft created in the shortest possible time, on the basis of a conceptually different machine, had many disadvantages and limitations. Weak armament, short range, altitude and speed, technical difficulties and so on. And the Redden design, which simplified the creation of the aircraft, did not justify itself in the long term, and the machines of the next generations no longer used it. As a combat vehicle, the Yak-15 was never really taken seriously and did not participate in military conflicts. There were theories about it appearing in Korea in the early 1950s, but there was no confirmation of this. Besides, the MiG-15 was ruling there. But, despite the modest capabilities, the small number and short history, the contribution of the Yak-15 is enormous. In fact, it was the first Soviet jet aircraft that was put into operation. It became the machine that was worked on first by the industry that was rebuilding itself under the new paradigm. It was on it that many flight and technical solutions were worked out, and it was this plane that, to a decent extent, guided pilots from piston to jet aircraft. So the Yak-15 was a small, but still the first step in the long journey of military jet aviation, the path that we are still walking briskly. And that is the story of our pioneer. I'd like to thank the Vadim Zadorozhny Vehicle Museum for letting us meet their plane. Like and subscribe to the channel, and if you want to watch the videos early, see some exclusive behind the scenes content or just support the channel, consider joining our Patreon community. Fast flights and soft landings to you.